Hello my beautiful watchers, and welcome back to A Dom of Ice and Fire, a comparison of the first season of HBO's Game of Thrones to A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. This is Episode 9, Baylor. Spoilers are coming. Fire and spoilers. Hear me spoiler. Ours is the spoiler. Family, duty, spoilers. If you're not up to date with all books and seasons of the show and still choose to watch this loose-lipped review, you have no one to blame but yourself. Let's do this. Varys talking Ned into accepting Cersei's offer to let him join the Night's Watch in exchange for making a false confession of treason and pretending that Joffrey is the true heir to the Iron Throne by reminding him that they have Sansa hostage and have no compelling reason not to kill her. Rob and his newly formed army arriving at the Twins, a pair of keeps and a bridge that cross the Trident River, ancestral home of House Frey, technically sworn bannermen to the Tullys, but currently headed by an elderly, grumpy, lecherous, and historically very unreliable lord named Walder. Fuck you, Catelyn Stark getting sent to negotiate, as it's the only way south that will allow them to sneak around Tywin Lannister's army, and they can't storm the castles before the lions get to them. The old geezer being bitter that he's never been taken seriously by the other houses, ignoring the fact that he's never earned any respect from them through his behaviour. Fuck you, Catelyn Stark being able to get good results, full use of the bridge and the Frey army, but at a high price. Price, Rob taking a Frey as his squire, and Arya and Rob marrying Freys in the future. Rob agreeing, though very grumpily. Lord Commander Mormont giving Jon Snow his family's Valyrian steel hand and a half sword called Longclaw in gratitude for him saving his life. Explaining that the original bear themed handler had burned away in the fire, so he'd had a white direwolf pummel installed. Him also mentioning he'd sent Sir Alistair away to King's Landing with the still twitching dismembered White's hand to prove to them that the undead threat was real, and to get him away from Jon and Castle Black for a bit while the attempted stabbing blew over. Sam, now in charge of looking after Maester Aemon's ravens, sneaking John info about Rob going to war. Maester Aemon getting it out of Sam that John knows, and having a heart-to-heart -heart with him about staying in the Watch, revealing that he's a Targaryen so he understands the temptation, seeing as he had to live through the destruction of his house. It's also true that he never actually tries to talk John out of leaving, just explains to him that his decision, whatever he chooses to do, will haunt him forever. Random piece of trivia that Kaluna noticed and pointed out to me, in this scene where Jon converses with one of the last Targaryens in the world, Martin goes out of his way to say that Snow's left hand ends up covered in blood from the meat that he's feeding to the ravens, and his right hand is badly burned from the fire the night before. Fire on one hand, blood on the other. If you like foreshadowing and symbolism like that, she did this whole thing on the Starks and the Seven Gods, and a breakdown of Book Danny's experience in the House of the Undying. I highly recommend watching both. Carl Drogo, overcome with infection from his wound, falling off his horse mid-ride. Daenerys, desperate to save him despite being told by everyone that he is as good as dead, doubling down on her faith that Mira Mazdor would follow her oath to heal the sick, even if they are her tormentors. Jura advising they cheese it and head for the nearest port, explaining that the Dothraki care more about strength in the line of succession, so when Drogo dies, her son will be killed by the next potential Carl. Daenerys rejecting this out of her love for Drogo, and imploring Mira Mazador to do anything it takes, even dark magic, to bring him back to her. Mira using Drogo's horse as a blood sacrifice, and starting some crazy dark shit in the tent, causing a brief fight outside as some of the Kalasar try to stop it and clash with the people loyal to Daenerys. Tywin Lannister deciding that his son Tyrion should fight in the front lines in the coming battle. The tactics of the battle and Tyrion's part in it were a bit more complicated in the book, involving fake routes and flanking manoeuvres. I'll talk more about it in a second. The show limiting itself to saying that he'll be in the vanguard is close enough though, probably taking into account that not everyone is as into talking about battle tactics for hours on ends as nerds like me are. Okay, so, Shay. Shay. Shay, Shay, Shay. Hmm, yeah, uh, ah, mm, yeah. okay, no, I can't do it, I'm sorry, my current format of episode by episode reviews is just not going to work for Shay. She's going to be one of the first people who gets a whole episode to herself as soon as I'm done with season one. For now, it's plot accurate that Tyrion sent Bronn to find him an attractive whore from the camp followers, and he took her from a minor knight that she was already working for. And they seem to hit it off, her having no issues with his stature, and they spend the night together before the battle. Tywin 
in winning the battle, but getting word right after that he's been bamboozled by Rob, who snuck around behind him and ambushed Jamie's second Lannister army that was besieging Riverrun, taking the Kingslayer hostage. Again, there were more tactical breakdowns in the book. Jamie was lured away from his main force by the Blackfish, who predicted that Jamie would be bored and impatient with overseeing a slow siege, so pretended to be a leftover Tully raiding party that he could ride after and destroy, leading him right into Rob's ambush in the Whispering Wood. But again, in my opinion, it's close enough. I'm not going to gripe over the lack of clunky exposition it would take to make it clear that's what happened here. Arya, post escape from the Red Keep, living on the streets of King's Landing, eating pigeons to survive, failing to negotiate food from a vendor, and getting word that her father is being brought out for public trial. Her watching Ned make his entirely fictitious confession from the shadow of a statue of Baylor the Blessed. Joffrey going back on the deal made with Eddard, and... And... Having him beheaded by Ellen Peng with his own Valyrian steel great sword ice! Arya making a move to save her dad but getting grabbed by the Night's Watch recruiter Yoran! <laughs> no! 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 It's still not okay! Varys only made one visit to Ned in the book, but the chapter breaks didn't quite mesh up with the episode breaks this time around, so they had him coming back later to finish off their conversation. As mentioned in episodes past, Tyrion's story about his first wife was originally confided to Bronn on the High Road. The version he tells to Shay is mostly accurate aside from the omission that Tywin, after forcing the girl to sleep with all of his guards, forced Tyrion to rape her as well and paid her with a gold coin for it because Lannisters are worth more. This is doubly dark when Tyrion Tyrion finds out the real, real truth of the matter a few books later. A large, and mostly uncommented on change between the book and the show, is the army that Rob fielded against Tywin. In the show, it's a paltry 2,000 men, a decoy army sent on a suicide mission to allow the rest of the army to get around him, and ultimately not a huge loss for the North. In the book, it was no such pawn sacrifice. Rob assigned a huge percentage of his army, almost all of his foot soldiers, to the command of Lord Bolton, with orders to stop Tywin from getting north enough to endanger winter. Fell. Heeding Fuck You Catelyn Stark's admittedly pretty good advice, he chose Bolton specifically because he was known for being a cautious commander. Roos entered battle, presumably because he thought he might be able to catch Tywin off guard by sneaking up on him overnight. This proved incorrect, but he didn't fall for a deadly trap that Tywin set up involving an intentionally weak left flank, which meant he could retreat with most of his army intact when he realised he was going to lose the battle. In the show's version of events, it seems, at first glance, super clever that Rob sacrificed a small part of his force to destroy a huge part of the Lannisters, but if you understand the geography of Westeros, you realise that the North is now basically undefended because its entire army is now south of the enemy in the Riverlands. One has to assume that Rob left a garrison at Moat Kaelin, but that wouldn't be enough to hold Tywin forever. Tywin doesn't take advantage of this opening by sending raiding parties into the North that Rob has to deal with because... It would be inconvenient for these showrunners, I guess. Even though he was aware of how much more there was to do, Book Rob did not make a gloomy speech to his men about how little they'd actually achieved right after the battle, presumably because he knew better than his show counterpart that it would be a dick move to demoralise his men just after they finally had something to celebrate. Several other Dothraki were involved in the fight outside Drogo's tent in the book, as Drogo's blood riders clashed with Mormont and the bodyguards sworn to Danny. One actually gets a knife to Danny's throat, but is killed with an arrow before he can use it. In these shows, Quotho died due to an apparent lack of understanding of armour, whereas originally Jorah took the Arak in his leg and it got stuck in his hip bone, allowing for his fatal counterattack. It's a very minor thing, but it was Jon, not Mormon, who suggested keeping the name Longclaw in the book, seeing as wolves have claws as well as bears. I think it's another tiny example of the show stripping away Jon's agency wherever possible in the first season. It looks like they might have edited the Targaryen family tree slightly, skipping a generation and making Aemon the Mad King's uncle instead of his great uncle. I can't really think of a reason why, aside from simplicity I guess? Due to all the incest and them repeating the same seven names over and over again, deciphering the lineage of House Targaryen makes the eyes water just a bit. Because we're denied Danny's internal monologue in this show, you don't necessarily know just how badly she did not want to be taken into the tent, but was in far too much pain to tell Jorah. I think she knew on some level that it would spell doom for her son. There's nothing in the book to suggest that Ned saw Arya in the crowd and directed Yoren to her, besides the fact that the old crow does despite hardly knowing her, was the only person who ever recognised her while she was dressed in her sword practice tunic and covered in filth. There's nothing that definitively proves it didn't happen though, so I guess we should put this in the maybe pile. 
Another part of the deal that Catelyn negotiated with Walder Frey was that two of his descendants would be fostered at Winterfell. They were both also called Walder and feature more in the next book, though ultimately have no great effect on the plot which explains their total omission. Podrick Payne was supposed to make his debut in this part of the story, held off until season 2. In case you were wondering, yes, in the book it is confirmed that he is related to Illyn Payne, the King's Justice. Sir Gregor Clegane, the mountain that rides, was in command of the Lannister forces that fought alongside Tyrion's clansmen in the book. Arya went to the docks in the book and noticed that the ship that Eddard had hired to take her back to the north was still there. There were men in grey guarding it, but fortunately Arya remembered Ciri's advice about seeing what's really there, not what she wanted to see, and realised they were a Lannister trap. Charles Dance's Tywin is safe from some humiliation the book Tywin suffered due to him proclaiming that Rob Stark would be easy to defeat because he would be brave but inexperienced, right before he finds out that he's been outfoxed by him strategically. One of the most disappointing parts of the episode is when the showrunners pulled a Tolkien on us and knocked out the POV character just before a battle and had him come to just after it was over. This is mean to the audience and to Tyrion as he actually fought pretty well in the battle, killing several foot soldiers and capturing a knight. Heck, he kills an enemy horse by stabbing his spiked helm into it like he's a freaking narwhal. The Battle of the Whispering Woods, on the other hand, is told from Fuck You Catelyn Stark's sideline perspective, so it also technically happens off screen in the book, saving it from this section. Left out of the show completely was Rob's only female bodyguard who rode with him into battle, Daisy Mormont. Yeah, the Mormonts are fucking everywhere in this story. In relation to the known Mormonts, she's niece, cousin, older sister. She'd apparently been training with a Morning Star since childhood and was mad sick with it. Some of the menfolk objected to her fighting, but Fuck You Catelyn Stark overruled them on the grounds that her son's safety was more important than their fragile egos. Huh, I've been saying quite a few nice things about Fuck You Catelyn Stark this episode. Don't worry, I'll be back to hating her soon. In case you were wondering, Daisy was, unfortunately, a guest at Edmure's wedding. The Dom's final thoughts. The universal limitations of a TV show compared to a book when it comes to things like battles become super obvious in this episode. I know I'm stating the bloody obvious here, but it doesn't cost George R. motherfucking R. Martin a blessed penny to write about tens of thousands of armed men clashing in the field, but it takes so much moolah to make that happen in live action, even with the help of modern computer generated imagery. Blockbuster Hollywood films can sometimes pull it off if they're willing to devote an ungodly amount of their ungodly budget to it, but a TV show? Forget about it. Aside from that, this is still satisfyingly, and at times heartbreakingly, book accurate. Everyone is still making their way along their G to the RR Martin created character arcs. <sighs> Looking back at season 1 now is almost melancholy after seeing the show and books diverging so far apart in later seasons, and do not even get me started on the post-book stuff. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers, and please remember that any threat from beyond the wall has nothing on the existential horror of the YouTube algorithm, and without your liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, and dragons if you have them, my channel is more screwed than Restros. See you later. Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the Dom, I can't do that. A mysterious but handsome wizard wearing sunglasses informed me you're spending the money on a cannon designed to allow you to shoot puppies into the sun. And I have no reason to assume whoever that was was making it up for his own amusement. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day and I will see you in the next episode.